I'm here. I got the door open. A fellow officer yells as I exit my squad car. The house was derelict. Run down would be the generous thing to say. The yard is overgrown and as unloved as the house. The closer I get to the front door, the harder it is not to gag. The overwhelming smell of ammonia and bad meat wafts from within. The wood of the porch is frayed as if slashed with millions of tiny knives. We've been getting calls about this lady for weeks, now complaining about the cats. They stayed in her yard. She appeared to be taking good care of them. Not much you can do with that, really, as far as the law is concerned. However, over the past week, the calls have rapidly increased. Now with reports that the cats were looking sickly. I hated to be the one to answer this call. My childhood home was overrun with cats. I was the kid at school no one sat near because he smelled like cat piss. My daughter has only one, and she takes care of him very well. I don't have the heart to tell her how much I hate them. I slowly entered the house, gun drawn, ready for what awaited me. The inside is an absolute mess of food smears, hair, and animal feces turned white and fuzzed with age. That all-too-familiar smell hits me with dreadful nostalgia. I don't understand how a house can be so dusty but so oily at the same time. Almost every piece of furniture is frayed like the porch. The sofa's ripped to hell. The table legs have been clawed so much that I'm surprised it still stands. There are two officers that arrived on scene before me. The officer's voice that I heard upon arrival belonged to Billy Sarvis. He still looks winded from having to break the door down. His eyes scan the largest room of the house. We step over various items of neglect and search. Every room is uneventful so far except for a bathroom that contained an overflowing, claw-footed tub of gritty cat waste. There's only one more room to go. Her basement. The smell increases ever still. I rub some Vicks under my nose, an old trick I remember from childhood. We start to descend the stairs, hoping not to find much of anything, but also knowing that smell has to lead somewhere terrible. The room is surprisingly clean. I don't see anybody down there. Nothing looks disturbed. The light switch isn't working, so I have to rely on my flashlight. I do a quick sweep of the room. Just as I hoped. I don't see much of anything. And then, my light rests on a far corner of the room. There's a mass of fur, too large and oddly colored to be any animal that I recognize. It looked like a huge pile of fur coats. Fur coats don't make sound, though. I hear a sickening cacophony of chews, licks, and growls. Coats also don't wriggle around on their own, either. As soon as the beam of light hits, it explodes into a scattering of whites, yellows, orange, blacks, and browns. Cats. It's a huge group of huddled-up cats. Temporarily distracted, I don't immediately see what they're all huddled around. I wish now that I hadn't. All these years as an officer, I thought I'd seen everything. I was wrong. The two other officers turned their lights on as well. With all the new visibility, we instantly see hundreds, and I mean hundreds, of tiny red footprints all over the floor repeating over and over again. They're even on the stairs we've just come down. There, on the floor, is a bloody mess that appears to have once been an elderly woman. She's wearing a worn paisley dress that's in bloody tatters. She's been there for quite a while and the cat's the cats were eating her. I don't believe that's how she initially died, but they definitely took advantage of the event. There are two left behind, the skinniest of the group, enjoying their dinner too much to be frightened away. 
Their mouths gleam with red. Droplets of blood and flesh stick to their whiskers, growling at each other between chews. They seem to lick up the blood as soon as they draw it out. I shudder to think about it. Oh, God, Sarvis exclaims, running to the opposite corner to vomit. He's the newest officer here. Not to say I don't have a hard time not doing the same thing. Have you ever seen anything like this in your life? The officer asked me. I shake my head, not being able to take my eyes off the partially consumed body. I look over and see a book lying next to her, barely affected by the pool of blood that surrounds her. I put on gloves to pick it up. It appears to be a journal of some sort. We call for the coroner, animal control, and forensics to arrive. I open the book and begin reading. July 10th, 1980. I've never been much of a cat person. Honestly, I'm not really a pet person at all, but especially not cats. They're litter box fumes that take over the entire house. All of the hair left laying around and the constant grooming always grosses me out. Also, why is it that every time a cat jumps and decides they want to cuddle, they always present themselves butt first? Is it just me? I don't know. I'm not completely heartless. The sad puppy eyes get me just as much as the next gal. I wouldn't wish harm on an animal. I just don't find them necessary as companions. So when I find a strange kitty sitting on the porch steps, I'm a bit confused. I know I'm not going to get any fans here, but... I'm sure if I just don't feed it, eventually it'll go away. July 18th, 1980. I'm wrong. A week later, and still, morning after morning, on my way out the door, it sits. He? She? It's a tuxedo cat. It has short hair and one and a half ears. It looks mangy, and its feet are stained with dirt. It tries to rub against me. I gently shoo it away with my foot in response. It shakes its rump as me as it saunters away. <laughs> yeah, the cat's definitely a he. July 24th, 1980. My roommate Iris has just come home from vacation a couple of days ago. This is the first chance I had to talk to her. I found her in the kitchen making what smelled like meatballs. And it smelled amazing. We got lucky, really. We hadn't known each other at all before we moved in together. Our situations had brought us to the right place at the right time, and it worked out. Despite my nervous social tendencies, we got along right away. I was totally comfortable around her. Undated. I asked Iris where the tuna was, hoping to make sandwiches. Her eyes looked to me without lifting her face. She said... Laurel, there was the cutest little kitty on the porch when I came home. He was just sitting there waiting for me, and he looked so hungry. Of course I got on to her about it. Great, now he will never go away. Did you give him a name, too? I ask her. Iris is trying hard not to show her excitement. She tells me, yes, she named him Pepe, after the cartoon character. She said he looked just like him. My annoyance grows more and more at the situation. I tell her we just re-mulched the front yard and it looks nice. How long does she think that's going to last with a cat outside? She lifts a finger as if she's already thought of this. Well, then... Maybe he can be an inside cat? Was the suggestion she gave me. No way, Iris. I'm sorry, I'm really not comfortable with stray cats hanging around. I tell her if she stops putting food out, then he'll move on to someone else. I asked her to please respect me on this. I couldn't believe that we had to have this conversation. It was the first term that we'd ever disagreed on, and I feel like a total jerk. I know it won't change my mind, though, and she needs to know how I feel about it. I should have just lied to her and told her I was deathly allergic. August 4th, 1980. I wake up late and have to rush out. There's a lot to do today. I get about five miles down the road when something terrible assaults my nostrils. 
It's honestly one of the worst smells I've ever experienced. My eyes dart around my car to see where it could be coming from. As soon as I get out of my car, I check my patchwork boots. Sure enough, bottom of my left boot has cat shit all over it. That's why I'll never want a cat. They're all fluff and balls of yarn. Just wait until you track their shit all over. It's in the grooves of my shoe and also my brake and gas pedals. The shoe I can take to the tub and hose off with a high-pressure shower setting. The pedals, though? That all has to be cleaned by hand. I pull back into the driveway, trying to put it out of my mind. As I get in front of the porch steps, I find one steaming, smeared pile right in the mulch. God damn it! I yell loud to the sky, as if my voice can be heard to the vastness of the cosmos. September 3rd, 1980. Iris isn't home. Her boyfriend Eric has the weekend off, so she's staying with him tonight. They usually alternate between his place and ours. I don't need to tell you that I prefer it when she stays there, honestly. The house stays cleaner, I get to listen to my music as loud as I want, and can eat dinner in my underwear. Oh, and no guttural sex chanting through all the hours of the night, and sometimes the next morning. That's nice, too. Dates illegible. I walk out to check our mail, and Pepe runs towards me, weaving in and out between my feet with a swiftness I can't match. I trip and almost fall right into a rake face first. As I just barely catch myself, I see the cat sitting there, staring at me. The look in his eyes is unmistakable. He knows he tripped me. That fucking cat could have killed me. I try to shoo him away with my foot and he hisses at me. He trips me, almost gravely injures me, and then he has the balls to hiss at me? <sighs> Fucking cats. And Jesus Christ, wouldn't you know, another pile in the mulch. I just can't pick this up or scoop it with a plastic shovel. Whatever this cat's eating clearly isn't working for its stomach. Enough is enough. I call my parents and ask to borrow their cat carrier. Undated. The next day, I take Pepe for a drive to the next town, find a gas station, and drop him off behind it. The gas stations in Florida are loaded with stray cats at night. Surely they'll adopt him and find him food. Satisfied, I go back to my car and take the hour drive home. I tell Iris I found him a good home and that he'll be happier now. I feel good about what I've done. My mind justifies itself by telling me that I'm helping him, but really, I only care about myself and my yard. September 24th, 1980. A week has gone by, and it's been awesome. A totally hair-free, poop-free, cat-free week. Pepe's probably off having fun with his new merry band of wayward cats. Iris is happy because she thinks the problem was solved without any trips to the Humane Society. I even tell her he'll be an inside cat so she won't worry about him getting hit by any cars. October 5th, 1980. My best friend Jennifer has called to ask if I want lunch. I'm happy to accept the invitation. I've just bought a new black and white paisley dress. I go outside and my blood chills to see a familiar sight. I shake my head and reopen my eyes. It's Pepe. He's come back. They say this happens all the time. Pets travel great distances to find their owners. We'd been seeing this cat for less than two months though and I have no emotional relationship with him. He sits on his hind legs, sharpening his claws on my tires. Stop that, I yell. I know cat claws can't flatten a tire from one time, but over time and repetition, they sure might. I get into my car and leave and turn on the air. My windshield's wet, the wiper's smeared away, and it tells me it's not just water. Instantly, the smell of ammonia wafts in from my AC vents. That fucking cat. Also, that's another thing. 
Remember when things got weird earlier with me talking about the cat scat? Well, the same thing goes for cat urine. No other animals is like it, with the males being the worst. It's hard to get the scent out of your clothes. Laurel's no cat reason number 74. Sometimes they won't even use the cleanest of cat boxes and will just piss on your clothes. Real nice. How in the hell was I going to clean this up? It had already dripped down under the hood of my car and affected every single atom of air that came through the vents. With it being almost 90 degrees outside, what choice did I have but to endure it? I make sure discreetly when I get out of my car that the smell didn't transfer to my dress. I go in and meet with my long-missed friend Jennifer, putting Pepe far out of my mind. We have such a good time and have more drinks than expected. Pretty soon, I'm wasted, emboldened by alcohol and rejuvenated by my visit with Jennifer. It almost doesn't even bother me that I have to sit in a human cat box on my way home. I roll the windows down as the night brings in refreshing cool air. I pull it to my drive and there he sits, my feline nemesis, Pepe. He leers at me when I open my car door, but I don't even care. I feel amazing. As I walk by him, go up the steps, he swats at my foot, catching a toe with his claw and drawing blood. What the hell, cat? November 22nd, 1980. I'm not proud of myself, and I wish I could blame it on temporary insanity due to blood loss. I went right inside my house, got a pinch of weed, a knife, and a can of food Iris had bought. If I'm going to do this, I'll make him feel good first. I'll sprinkle the herb over the food, put it in this new thing called a Tupperware container, and return outside. He looks at me warily, seeing and smelling the container from afar. I sit it down and step away. As soon as he deems me at an appropriate distance, he circles the food bowl. He sniffs it a couple times, then jumps back as if it's going to lunge at him and bite him. Finally, he settles and really starts chowing down. I creep up behind him and steady with the knife. I have to get it right the first time. There won't be a second try. With one swift motion, I grab the scruff of his neck, hold him down, and cut off his tail. I'm afraid the blade won't make it all the way through one shot, but it does. He yowls in pain and releases from my grip, turning around to attack me. I cover him with a towel and hold him there. He eventually falls silent and still, knowing he's not going to be able to run off. My hands are bloody and I'm delirious from drinking earlier in the day. Iris pulls up in her car. She leaps out and starts running to me, not sure what she's saying. Laurel, are you are you hurt? What? What happened to your hands? Upon seeing the cat, her face darkens. I can see flames in her eyes. That is it. To not prefer animals is one thing, but this is totally sick. He's an innocent creature. Her eyes filled with tears. Fuck it. I was going to tell you after we paid rent, but I'm moving in with Eric. You need to get him to a vet. By then, Pepe had disappeared. I knew what I did was messed up. I don't blame her for reacting the way she did. The mind doesn't work that way when you're drunk, though, does it? Fine, I responded, slurring my speech. Go live with your boyfriend, and I'll be here on my own, and with no pets. I don't mean it. How far could our friendship possibly progress now, though? Sometimes it's best just to let things go. Even people. December 1st, 1980. Eric's truck comes and goes a few times over the days to help move her things. Iris and I don't even say goodbye, really. She tries to talk to me. I'm too distracted, staring out the window, trying to make sure the cat's gone for good. Eventually, I hear her say, Fine, bye then. 
If that cat comes back, just call me and I'll take him home with me. It sounds odd hearing her say the word home and knowing she's not referring to this place. She mutters a fucking animal killer on her way out the door. Eventually it's time for me to leave the house again. I'm going to go out of town to treat myself to a night out. Maybe I can find a nice man to sweat my frustrations out with. Forget the mess about Iris and the cat. A night away is most definitely exactly what I need. And soon. Date eligible. I go out and have such a nice time that I decide to spend the night. Know that I went out, had fun, looked for some company, found some company, and spent the night. I had a few drinks, not nearly as many as the time before, definitely not enough to excuse my decisions. I woke up feeling dried out and excited to go home. I slip out from the arm atop me and sneak out the front door. When I get home, I can't believe my eyes. Out through my windshield, I see that my entire porch is shredded. It looks like a whole kennel of cats attacked the porch all at once. Their claws eating away at the wood like sharp termites. How the fuck could one cat have done all this, especially injured? Forget about pissing me off. This was just scary now. This porch was hand-built by the man who rented the house's grandfather. Can you imagine how pissed he will be once he sees this? I can't believe it. There's no way this cat isn't intentionally malicious. I'd had enough. December 25th, 1980. I back up my car a little and sit at the end of the driveway, waiting to see if Pepe will disappear. After not too long, he does. He saunters up to the porch, tail stub mangled and yellow with infection. He sharpens his claws a few quick times, almost as if he knows I'm watching. He walks to the middle of the yard and lays there, sunbathing like he owns the place. I put my car into drive and floor it. There's no way this asshole will have time to get away, and this time I'll be done for good. No more cat shit, I think, as I feel the tires go over the bump. No more pissing on my car, I think, as I reverse and run over him again. No more cat. I know it's cold and heartless, but I scoop up his little body with a shovel, put it into a trash bag, and throw it in the waste bin. I'm finally done with this whole thing. No one can judge me. The pound would have killed him anyway. His death was quick, and though I can't speak for him personally, I would like to think it was painless. Five empty pages follow. I have made a huge mistake. I don't mean that I'm remorseful for taking a life that was clearly out to get mine. I mean nothing could have ever prepared me for my repercussions. For every day since the day I sent Pepe to his resting place, a new cat would show up. On the first day, there was one, and I noticed the trash bin had been knocked over. The second day, there were two, so on and so forth. I tried shooting them, but around the twelfth day, it became too much. They seemed to be more menacing the larger their group became. Maybe I deserved this. April 16th, 1981. Eventually, I gave up and accepted my consequences of fate. I didn't bother to clear the yard. I put a cat box in every room and even installed a pet door so they could come and go as they pleased. After a while, the numbers stopped increasing. However, by then, most of the cats had bred, starting a new generation of horror. I kept a punch bowl on the counter filled with food for them, and one tub was always filled with water. The other tub takes place of a litter box. Forty-five adult cats. Infinite amounts of kittens, and still breeding. They clawed at my clothes, my face, my feet especially. 
They wanted to destroy me and everything I enjoyed for my home. After what I did, how could I blame them? A long while after it started, he came. Maybe I'm delirious from fumes. Maybe I've finally lost my mind, but I swear I see Pepe. Sitting outside, looking in. His tail is gone. His body's misshapen. He has one and a half ears and an eye that hangs from its socket. February 10th, 1983. I know that I have a forever pet and a friend who will never leave my side. I have friends of all colors, ages, sizes, and fur links, dozens of them. They live with me and I live through them. It's crazy how a slight change in perspective can change everything, isn't it? In my earlier years, I was called Laurel Johnson. But now, now they call the Cat Lady of Lindeland County. I search the pages for the most recent date and find that the last entry was written almost 20 years ago. The page is yellowed, but the ink unfaded. The teams come in and do their jobs, none of them much surprised by the sight. I make last minute statements for the reports and leave the scene. On the drive home, as I look in my rearview mirror, I see a flash of a little yellow glowing eye. It's a black and white clump of fur with no tail and half an ear. I do a double take to make sure of what I was seeing, and it was gone. I think I'm going to be extra nice to my daughter's cat when I get home tonight. Hey everyone, just wanted to cut in here real quick and let you know that if you're enjoying the video, leaving a like is greatly, greatly appreciated. It really helps get the video out to new people who may enjoy these stories as much as you and I do. So, if you're enjoying yourself so far, drop a like and leave me a comment down below with just something interesting. Anything, really. Doesn't matter. That also helps to push the video out to more people. And I'd really, really appreciate that. I'll stop rambling now and we can jump right into the second story for tonight. I once had a film professor tell our class that making horror movies was like the old western prospectors that would pan for gold. He queued up a clip from some black and white cowboy movie that showed a skinny, raw-boned, shrunken little monkey of a man in overalls and a flipped brim hat, tugging a mule up to the edge of the river before getting out his metal pan. He'd said with a derisive sniff that people made horror movies because they were cheap to make, expectations were low, and if you hit it big, well, they were very profitable. The reality, of course, was that most never found more than a few gold flakes. His point was to convince us that horror was a creatively bankrupt and shallow genre, and that wasting time on it was a fool's errand. What he actually accomplished, at least as me and my friends in the class were concerned, was simply to reconfirm our option that he was an out-of-touch, pompous asshole. Horror movies could be made cheaply, that's true, and depending on the script and the crew's ability to do less with more, you could make a really cool movie for a fraction of the cost of, say, a fantasy or period drama. But beside all of that, there was one simple fact that caused our little filmmaking group to make our first post-graduation project a scary movie. Because horror is badass. We threw a different idea around for a few weeks. Production needed to be aggressively economical. We didn't want to do anything of the tired subgenres without a fresh approach, and we had none. So no demonic possession, no film crews as character inexplicably trapped in the woods, and no fucking haunted houses. Initially, we were trying to avoid using the found footage format entirely, but... Look, it's a lot cheaper and easier for some things. You still have to do your best, of course, but there's a rough edge here or there. Well, audiences are a lot more forgiving of sloppy camera work and bad lighting when you're a found footage film. And we had a decently cool idea that seemed like it might actually work. 
the cursed film genre isn't anything new, right? Aside from the big ones like The Ring, you've got more and more smaller films popping up all the time. Some are found footage, some are mockumentaries, and some are just... Well, they're more experimental. I'd gone with Jacob, our group's unofficial leader and director, to a couple of underground film festivals and seen some pretty weird shit. He'd agreed with me that he didn't want to get too extreme. The film needed to be marketable and have a chance at a film festival that didn't take place at an abandoned bottling plant. But he did think he had a neat twist. We'd make a found footage movie about making a found footage movie. Okay, pretty standard stuff so far. I've seen dozens of these, the crew is a victim kind of things, and they usually leave me pretty cold. Maybe it's just because I'm in the business, but I usually find their acting and their work on the film they're supposedly making pretty inauthentic, and it just takes me out of it. And I get it. You've got to work with what you've got. You're not going to get the best actors in every role, but still, we were supposed to be moving away from cliché, not running into its arms. But wait, he said, there's more. The cast which would also be most of the crew, would only be aware of the surface plotline. They'd think we're making a found footage cursed movie about a film that runs afoul, or whatever. An evil skinwalker or the reincarnated soul of a serial killer. They'd have scenes where they filmed the movie, and they'd have scenes where they were picked off one by one. What they wouldn't realize is that there was a third layer, a deeper story, below the movie they were making and the movie they thought they were starring in. One where they got picked off for real. Our sound editor, Katie, she got snatched in the parking lot after a midnight shot. The writers, Paul and Sarah, they'd get taken in their apartment and then a cryptic video of their abduction would be sent to me. Jacob said it'd be part of his third, realer story that I'd show the video to him and we'd agree with just them throwing a weird tantrum because of some of the changes he was making in the script. I'd be the next to go, followed by our cameraman, Brad. At the end, only Jacob would be left. We were drinking when Jacob told me this idea, but the intensity in which he was telling me all this cut through most of the alcohol. He wasn't kidding. And yeah, it was an interesting idea, but... Are you talking about, like, really hurting them or something? I shouldn't have had to ask the question, as I should have known that something was deeply wrong that I felt I needed to. I'd known Jacob for nearly three years, and while he could be very arrogant and hard to deal with at times, he wasn't a bad guy. I'd never seen him do anything violent or physically dangerous to anyone. But at the same time, I considered him my friend, but I didn't trust him. He had a hardness underneath his big ideas and driven enthusiasm that, well, made me question exactly how far he was willing to go. My stomach nodded as I said the words, and I felt a rush of relief as his eyes widened into shock. What? Jesus, of course not. Fuck, man, I'm not crazy. I gave her a relieved laugh. I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. But how would that work? How are we going to make them all disappear if they aren't in on the joke? I mean, we could just tell them as it comes, but it's kind of lame if we're just having a series of conversations about, gosh, I wonder where Katie went, and there's no action. He grinned, his eyes taking on that twinkle I didn't like. Oh. <laughs> we'll have footage. Plenty of it. Look, here's the deal. I've gotten us some backing. Not just money, but a couple of guys that are trained professionals. They're the real deal. They do bodyguard jobs, hostage rescues, the whole thing. These are the types that some rich guy hires when his kid gets snatched during spring break. I tried to break in, but he just looked away and kept going. Anyway, this Asian company my dad does a lot of business with, they have a small film division. 
They don't want to come into the project as a full producer or anything, but they are willing to invest some cash and a couple of their top security guys to do the extra scenes. My stomach began to twist into another knot. You're joking again, right? Jacob frowned. No, this is awesome. Why would I be joking? It's not like they're going to get hurt. They're just going to be taken and secured in a location long enough for me to explain what's going on. It's no big deal. I sat back in my chair. <laughs> no big deal? They'll be terrified. Some strange dudes grabbing them and carrying them off somewhere, and you'll have them in some costume or something, right? What if they fall or run into traffic or... What if one of them has a gun? I don't know what Katie or Paul does, but I'm pretty sure Brad goes deer hunting and Sarah already gets panic attacks and he raises his hands. Slow your roll, man. These are professionals. They're going to get them in safe spots. They pick the time and the place. The only rules they have is that they can't hurt them and they can't let them get hurt. And they have to keep their body cams rolling until I say cut. Even if that's true. It's still a fucking dirty trick to play on your friends. They'll hate us, maybe sue us. And they sure as hell won't finish working on the film. Jacob grinned. Won't they? See, the money I'm getting from the investors, it's not going into shooting it. That's already covered well enough. Instead, it's going into 25,000 completion bonuses for each of us. When they get taken, safely taken... I'll immediately go to them and tell them what's up. That we wanted their real reactions, their raw emotions, that everything is fine, that they just need to stay in a nice hotel room they've been given a couple of weeks while we wrap up principal. After that, they go back to whatever they have left on the film, and it's all done. If they stuck it out, they get 25k. He snickered. <laughs> Let's see if any of them hate me then. He studied my silent stare for a moment before pressing on. Besides, when we get into looking for a distributor, think of all the press we can generate. Interviews, whole articles about the movie and how it was made. We'll all be fucking horror rock stars before we're done. Shrugged. My head was aching, and I didn't know what to do. It was a lot of money, and we could all use it. And as pushy as Jacob could be, he was also very competent and professional when it came to work. If he said it was safe and legit, it probably was. I just... <sighs> Look, we have to be really careful with this, okay? These are real people, not characters in a movie. And they're our friends. If either of us decides to pull the plug or if any of them aren't cool, once you explain everything, we stop. Okay? Jacob's eyes lit up as he nodded. Of course, of course. <laughs> I wouldn't have it any other way. We started filming the next week. My primary roles were assistant director and editor, and I spent my time between being on sets and reviewing the prior dailies. Everything was going just okay. The surface story was pretty bland, but we'd had good luck with locations and the weather cooperated so far. Everyone's acting was... well, it was passable, but everyone was too stiff and self-aware. Maybe it was because I was watching and re-watching the footage, but it became increasingly clear that there was no real danger, no real stakes, just amateur filmmakers playing at being amateur actors. And that's when Katie went missing. Jacob had told me he wouldn't tell me exactly what was going to happen when, so it would be easier for me to hide what I knew from the others. I'd been expecting her to go early, but not quite so fast. Brad and I could cover basic sound capture, but it wouldn't be anywhere near as good as what she could do. Still, when she didn't show up or answer her phone, I guess that Jacob's secret third movie had started. Everyone was worried about Kate at first, but then we got a mass text from her saying that she'd had a fly-up to be with her mother in Colorado. Emergency surgery or something. 
It was easy enough to fake, but no one was suspicious at that point. The next ones to go was supposed to be Paul and Sarah, but it wasn't. It was Brad. He'd been on a lunch break that he never came back from. We were shooting at a rest stop at the time, so there weren't lots of places to look, but there was no sign of him at all. No answer from his phone, either. Brad had ridden out with Jacob that day, so his car wasn't left behind, but when Sarah went by his house the next day, it was sitting in his driveway. No sign of Brad, though. And she couldn't get anyone to the door when she knocked, despite the fact it was early in the morning and he lived with his girlfriend. It was at this point I started getting really worried. Jacob had said we needed to keep radio silent about the secret movie while we were filming to avoid any slip-ups or arousing the other's suspicion. After each abduction, he told me he'd just text me their names and a thumbs-up emoji after he talked with them and everything was cool. He'd done it for Katie after we'd broke for the night. He did it for Brad after we spent hours searching for him around the rest stop, Jacob filming the whole time. I didn't have any reason to think that he was lying, but I also couldn't be sure he wasn't. What if they had gotten hurt? What if they were super pissed and wouldn't agree to anything? Would he force them to stay somewhere anyway just to keep the movie going? I didn't think so, but... By the third day after Brad's disappearance, I couldn't take it anymore. I needed to talk to him, to talk to them. When I approached Jacob about it, he just glared at me. You know that's not possible. We have to keep this shit tight. We've already wasted half a week petting up Paul and Sarah just to keep them going. I need their last three scenes done before we can move on to you and then the finale. I frowned. That's another thing. Why did you do them out of order? Brad was supposed to be last except for me. As it is, I'm having to do video, audio, and editing now. He snorted. <laughs> Brad's camera work sucks, so that'll be an improvement. And I had to mix it up so you look tense, too. Not being mean, but your acting is balls. But since Brad, you've got a lot more organic. A lot more real. All of you had. He wasn't wrong. There had been a palpable tension since Katie's disappearance, and it had only grown with Brad missing. It was all starting to feel like something powerful, unique. And that was exciting, especially if we could keep the wheels from coming off before we were done. Still, the gnawing in my belly demanded I try one more time. Can you have them call me, at least? Let me see how they're doing. Jacob raised an eyebrow. I told you they're all fine. Thumbs up, remember? If you don't trust me, then you're free to quit the film. I'm sure everybody will be happy to split your share of... Well, everything that's going to come from this. He stopped and just stared at me until I dropped my eyes and shrug. Okay, then. Let's get back out there while we have some light left. Four days later, I was standing outside of Paul and Sarah's apartment building. The sixth through eighth floors were engulfed in flames, and I knew from experience that their home was on the seventh. Jacob was beside me, screaming and crying, shouting to the firemen to please save his friend. Maybe to a passerby it would have seemed genuine. Jacob's a much better actor than I am. When he turned to look at me, his face drawn zero of despair. I saw that same glinting hardness in his eyes that I've always feared deep down because I didn't understand it. Now I was beginning to. It was the gleam of unrelenting, terrible will that could shed mercy and morality when it suited. It was a cold and reptilian drive that said nothing mattered but the chase and the kill and the feed. I just thought he was driven. But Jacob was far more than that. He was a monster. 
and as I recoiled in horror from him, from what he had done, his expression didn't change, his eyes didn't alter. The only reaction he had to my stepping away was to subtly tug at the place that the body cam nestled on his shirt. Apparently, I'd stepped out of frame. I'm writing this now, months after Katie and Brad went missing and Paul and Sarah's body were found melted together in their bathroom. I didn't write this before, tell anyone about this before, because I'm a coward. After the day of the fire, I drove home, I packed up my shit, and I went to the other side of the country. Aside from emailing my parents periodically, I haven't had contact with anyone from my old life. My hope is that if I stayed quiet and out of the way, Jacob would just leave me alone, that he'd likely be unable to find me given the steps I'd taken to secure anonymity, but even if he did, he would see that it wasn't worth the risk and exposure to come after me now. That's the very argument I made when he called me this morning. I told him I had a detailed account of what had happened, written and ready to be sent to the authorities if I went missing or turned up dead. That I didn't want any trouble, and I knew I was implicated in some of it, but if he started coming around, he'd leave me no choice but to expose both of us. He listened to my rambling threats patiently, and when I was done, he just gave me a short, hard laugh. <laughs> It's okay, kid. You tell whoever you want to. It's like they say, there's no such thing as bad publicity. But I'm out. Just leave me out. It's over with. Done. His voice was rougher now. Any trace of humor gone. Nothing is over until the film is finished. Then let me stay on and help you. We can finish it together. Jacob paused a moment as though considering the offer before responding. Yeah, I appreciate the thought, but it just won't work. Your contribution to the film is meant to be on screen this time. And besides, you know my rule. What? What rule? The director always gets the final cut. I'll be seeing you. The best and worst days of my life were separated by two years, three months, four days, three hours, and seven minutes. Give or take a few seconds. The best was the day of my wedding. It was the moment where my eyes swept along the curve of my wife's white gown and up to the tears in her eyes, watching them pour down the second I said, I do. That day was amazing, culminating in that one perfect moment. The worst? The day I lost her. Sitting in the ER, watching the surgeon come out only 20 minutes after she'd been rushed in. I knew then that she was gone. I had a drunk driver to thank for that. Maybe it sounds strange, being attached to someone. I married young. I could always find someone else, right? Except that there was no one else. When I met her, it was like something inside me just clicked into place. Everywhere we went, she bled color into the world, filling my vision with a kind of beauty that I can't express no matter how many useless words fill this page. She was my one and only. Jessica. Sorry, it's still hard to even write her name. It feels like the weight on my chest gets heavier every time. Even after her death, I went into a deep depression, as is to be expected. I stopped eating, going outside. I practically lived on the couch because I couldn't bear to be in our bed. I had her favorite pink silk nightgown perpetually balled up in my fist. It was like I could hold on to that one piece of her forever. 
Things went on like this for months. Even after my family tried to intervene, I just... I couldn't move on. I wouldn't let anyone touch her stuff. I still DVR'd her favorite shows. I would make her favorite foods and then leave them out on the counter, never touching them for myself. I was a mess. But as time goes on, and life goes on, whether you want it to or not, whether it's fair or not, I started with her toothbrush. One day, I caught myself staring at it for over an hour, and then, on an impulse, I grabbed it and threw it in the trash can. I sobbed for about 20 minutes afterwards. It's like a spell was broken. I gradually went back to daily life. Nothing was ever the same, and grief never disappears. You just learn to experience it differently. I had moved on as much as I ever would. Five years, two months, twelve days, four hours, and two minutes after the moment I lost her, I got her back. I'm an editor for our local newspaper. Not too bad a job. She'd be proud of me, but... Sometimes I get back sort of late at night. This happened to be one of those nights. I trudged in around 11, thinking I'd grab a beer since I'd been particularly productive that day, and hell, I deserved one. Her voice wafted to me from the kitchen. Hi, honey. You're back so late. Her voice, soft and sweet throws me in place. After she'd passed, I'd often have dreams where she was still alive. She'd convince me that everything that had passed had been nothing but a misunderstanding, and I'd always end up believing her. I'd hold her in my arms, and just as I was about to kiss her, I'd wake up on that grungy couch, tears already starting to form in my eyes as reality sunk in all too quickly. I figured I was having another one of those dreams. I squatted down and tried to steady my breathing. It had helped with my panic attacks in the past. Maybe it would help me stay calm now. I inhaled and exhaled slowly, trying to will myself to wake up. And then she popped around the corner. She looked just like the day she had left for work when the accident happened. Her blonde hair was wavy with just one piece on her bangs longer than the others. Her blue eyes practically jumped out of her skull. They were so big. She was tall, slender, dressed in a simple black dress and a dress coat. Now I knew I was dreaming. It was like she jumped right out of my nightmares. What are you doing down there? Come on, I'm trying to keep dinner warm for you. You're not real, I screamed. It was more to convince myself than anything else. In a moment, she was at my side. Andrew, what happened? What's wrong? I could feel her eyes searching my face, so I hid it behind my trembling hands. This was bad. I was having a breakdown. I tried to ward her off again. Go away! Leave me alone! This time she put her arms around me. Her lilac perfume washed through my insides, staining my heart. This was her. This was her touch. I could feel it in my bones that this is her. It's okay, it's okay. Shh. Everything's okay. Just relax. All the resistance I'd had fell away at that point. I cried in her arms for hours. I wouldn't let her go. I knew I was dreaming, but maybe this time I could make it last. Maybe I could just dream forever, never wake up. 
I was realizing now just how much I wanted that. Jessica eventually led me to our room. I refused to let go of her, so she climbed into bed with me, snuggling into my arms just like she used to. I tried to remain awake, knowing that once I fell asleep in my dream, it was all over. I stared at her perfect face, trying to etch it into my memory. Eventually, all my strength drained away, and I fell into a deep sleep. I woke up the next morning, stealing myself for a long day. Maybe I'd call into work sick, or would it be better to go in? Maybe I shouldn't be alone. I was contemplating these questions when I opened my eyes and saw that Jessica was still there. I was speechless, staring at her sleeping form until her eyes fluttered open. Hey, her coarse morning voice, just like I'd remembered. You're up early. You okay? You feel better? She rubbed the sleep out of her eyes, just like I'd remembered. Her every movement, just like I'd remembered. It felt like all the prayers I'd ever prayed had come true at that moment. So maybe I was still dreaming. Maybe I really could dream forever. I called into work sick and spent the day with Jessica. It was like she'd never left. She cooked me breakfast, we lazed around the couch and watched stupid romantic comedies, we even browsed Reddit together. The whole day, I wouldn't let go of her. She was always in my arms. She was mine again. And that night, we made love. That was the moment that convinced me it wasn't a dream. This was real, it was tangible, it was intimate, and it was everything it should have been, and more. I knew now I was in the real world with my real wife. I can honestly say I'd never been happier. I took a full week off work and just spent time with her. It was the best gift I'd ever been given. Gradually, the past five years began to feel like some bad joke. Here was my wife, and she'd never even left. Of course, I noticed some things were off. We never left the house. With her home, it seemed natural for us to stay together. I saw our kitchen stocked with food, even though neither of us had gone to the store. She never told anyone else that she was back. I never told them either. It wasn't that I was keeping her secrets. The moment she came back into my life, it was like the rest of the world didn't exist, like it had never existed in the first place. Lastly, we never addressed her death. I was petrified of bringing it up, as though it would break the delicate balance of her reappearance and she'd be gone again. I just pretended she was never gone and gradually began to believe it myself. After a week, I was sufficiently assured that she wasn't going anywhere. I went back to work. I'd come home to a home-cooked meal and romantic evenings. The spring came back to my stump, and I was always whistling, much to the annoyance of other subway passengers. It was bliss. And then it shattered. The burglar broke in around one in the morning. He was an amateur, unable to jimmy the lock. He thought he could break the downstairs window, and we couldn't hear. Fucking idiot. Of course, I jumped to my feet. Jessica followed close behind as I rushed down the stairs. I grabbed a baseball bat I keep in my room, but of course, the moron had a gun. I was protecting Jessica as best I could, shielding her and trying to hold down my panic. If I died now... I'd be separated from her again. My heart was thumping wildly. The guy's face, like seriously, not even a ski mask, changed abruptly as he stared at Jessica. 
and with a look of sheer terror. I've never seen someone that scared. Oh, God. Oh, fuck. What the fuck, you sick bastard? What the fuck is wrong with her? That was probably one of the most confusing moments of my life, second only to my dead wife cooking dinner for me. He practically jumped out of the window as I turned back to face Jessica. You know, when Jessica died, I didn't really have a chance to look at her. She was gone before I could see what the car accident had done to her, and of course, there was no open casket visitation. Now, however, I had the opportunity to see clearly for myself. I could see the bruising descending diagonally from her left shoulder down, matching the seatbelt that she'd been thrown against at 70 miles an hour. Her face was smashed in, chunks of glass jutting out from where the windshield had been crushed into her head. There was a piece of glass stuck in her right eye, a mess of pus and blood painting her face. Her right arm was twisted at all the wrong angles. You could just tell she tried to get in front of her face in time to lessen the blow. The rest of her was black and blue and a mess of blood. Should we call the cops? Her voice took me out of my daze. This was surreal. She looked at me innocently as though she was unaware of the mess that her body was in. After that, I tried everything I could to fix her. I washed her up, removed all the chunks of glass, but the moment I turned my back to throw them in the trash, they just reappeared. Blood flowed from her cuts in endless streams, converging into a river of gore that swelled at her feet. Although she continued to cook and clean for me and even come into our bed, there was nothing I could do to help her. As time went on, her body started to decay. I could tell it was happening when she began to swell up, her stomach distending her own skin a sickly shade of yellow. The smell came next. I could tell she was trying to cover it up with perfume. I watched as her hair began to fall away and her skin started to rot. After a month or so, I realized there was no way we could continue like this. So I sat Jessica down. Honey, I want you to know that I love you very much, but we both know that you shouldn't be here. Please. I need to know what happened to you. Until I reached the end of my question, Jessica held that perfect, innocent smile. But as soon as I finished, she broke down and began sobbing, pus pouring out of her tear ducts instead of tears. I know this might make you hate me, but I made a deal. My heart sank. Jessica, what did you do? She sniffled. Death isn't anything like what people say. He looked like an ordinary man to me, and when I died, it wasn't so bad. It was just like drifting through nothingness, but... I could still see you sometimes. Sometimes I'd find myself standing next to you, watching you, and I could feel your pain. I wanted so much to help you. So I asked Death to let me come back. Just one more chance. For a long time, he wouldn't listen. It's against the laws of nature, he said. It's not my place anymore, but... But then he saw your lifespan was shortening. You were supposed to live to be an old man. You were supposed to have kids and a full life. But instead, your life was getting shorter and shorter by the minute, like a candle about to burn out. It went from 80 years to 70 to 60 to 50 to 40. That's when he made a deal with me. 
He knew that if I came back, your lifespan would return to normal. He told me that our bond was too strong. We couldn't be separated. It was a mistake to pull us apart in the first place. He told me I could come back. The thing is, though, I couldn't let anyone but you see me or have any contact with me. If I did, I'd have to die again. Dead people don't belong in this world, but I wanted to be with you, no matter what the cost. At this point, Jessica was in hysterics. I did my best to comfort her, my soothing hand, careful not to pull away at the rotting skin. I spoke in a low, soft voice until she gradually relaxed. She cried herself to sleep, and I placed her in our bed. I'm writing this on Reddit because I want you all to know what I know. Sometimes love hurts. Sometimes it hurts the ones that you love the most. My love for Jessica became her burden. And now she's rotting here in front of my eyes. I can see how painful it is for her. I can see that balance must be restored. I've still got my dad's old Glock in the gun safe next to my bed. In a moment, I'll lay down next to the woman I love more than anything in the world, and I'll restore the balance. At least this time, we can go together. Hey everyone. I just wanted to say one more time, if you enjoyed the stories in tonight's video, go ahead and drop a like and leave me a comment down below saying which one was your favorite. Do you want more stories like these in the future? Do you want certain types of stories? Let me know that as well and I'll try to get in touch with some authors and see if we can do something like what you're asking for. Also again, if you want to see videos early, you can become a member or become a patron. Both of those links are in the description below. If you want just the audio for any video that's been up for the past like two years, honestly, um, there is an Anchor FM link, or you can just search up The Graveyard Shift with Mr. Davis anywhere you get your podcasts, and you'll find it, and the audio only will be available for you. Save your data and still get me on the go. So check all that out in the description below. Take care of yourselves and each other. And I'll see you guys very soon with a brand new video.